Hello everyone, it's Chris here and I'm going to run through the progress that I've made on Expand for this week. So I'll just start off by jumping into the pause menu. I've got lots of little changes to go through this week. So I, I added some options to this menu. I can return to the main menu, I can quit, or I can jump to the last checkpoint. At the moment that feature doesn't work, but return to the main menu does. So I'll just jump back there. Another change I made this week was uh, with the fonts and the type of fonts that I'm using. And so I noticed that when adding these three lines of text at the bottom of the pause menu, that the game took significantly longer to load. And after plotting around for a little bit, I realized that this was because the type of font that I'm trying to load at the moment is a textured font. So you have a rectangle with a texture that's loaded into memory. And I, with this game, I want resolution independent fonts. I want the fonts to be crisp no matter what resolution that they are on. Because you have this aesthetic of, you know, black and white and you know you want a very sort of clear and smooth um, look to it so what I was doing was I was loading in all these fonts at a very high size and then I was scaling them based on the resolution and so they would be loaded in at the maximum resolution size and scaled down accordingly but this took a lot of memory um, because each time I had one of these lines you know it was copying a big chunk into memory instead I looked for a more dynamic approach and that is by using what are called mesh fonts so mesh fonts are fonts that store the point and line uh, line data and in terms of OpenGL I would imagine it's stored in a display list and so when it comes to scaling the font it'll firstly sc uh, scale without any problems but you know and, and without taking so long it's much cheaper than sort of making big and deep copies into memory um, but when I did this I noticed something which I didn't quite hook onto before because I'm not a graphics person um, and that is that the fonts looked absolutely terrible. They're all jaggy. And I thought I had sort of implemented anti-aliasing and all that stuff, but it turned out that it wasn't sort of implemented and it wasn't running um, in my game, which is awesome because now I can do a few, I could do a few simple tweaks and fix a little bug that I had, and I can now get you know nice anti-aliased um, edges. Before, however, I was getting anti-aliased fonts because when you load in texture fonts, the font loader automatically um, alias the fonts like really nicely. So I didn't notice in that respect. But this edge around here is much sharper. I also have VSync on as well, which makes it quite a quite a bit of a difference. And the other thing I worked on this week was um, uh, sector groups, which I mentioned last week. So now when I load this first level, um, these all these things act as a group. So I'll just show you a script for that. And so now in level one, I create through the loader a sector group and I add a series of sectors to it. So these lines here. And I can modify each of these sector properties as well. But then I can also modify the group properties. So I could set the rotation every time the uh, screen updates um, by a little bit, which is what I'm doing here. This is not a, a good way to do it because it's not frame independent, but it's just a sample test case. And this leads me to another thing that I added this week was the ability to actually just set certain properties about sectors and sector groups. So things like the rotation, the start angle, the end angle, the inner radius, the outer radius. Before, you might be surprised to know that I didn't actually have these properties settable. Um, I, you know, I couldn't easily change them, but I could apply an animation to them. So it's just some basic functionality that I wanted because I don't want all the sectors and the sector groups to just follow animations. I want them to have dynamic behavior based around where the player is in the world. So for example, as I move left, a sector might come out, or as I move right, it might go in. I want this sort of thing. And so I added uh, a whole bunch of getters and setters there, and I have a little test case for that, but nothing really interesting. So this first script I load, just on every update, it modifies all of the properties, so you get a cool sort of spiraling effect. Um, I also changed something else this week. I added an event queue. So I'll just get myself squashed and jump back. Um, so I noticed when creating the first level for the game um, with, the, with the ARG um, demonstration level that it, I always wanted, because that was totally you know handcrafted, it wasn't procedural or anything interesting like that, um, You know, I would often want certain objects to be created at certain times. And one way to deal with this, which is the approach that I've taken, is to have an event queue. This is um, a different queue to the game engine event queue that I'm using. 
But in this event queue, you essentially register an event, you set what time you want that event to start, and then sort of a callback function. So in this case, my callback one will be called after three seconds, and it'll just print out something. And so I can register and unregister events here. I don't have an interesting test case for you because I just wanted to get it up and working. But over the next month or so, I, um, you know, I'm going to have yeah, levels created for the game and I'll be able to show you some of these features. Just two other small things which I added, uh, which was I made it so that you could set sectors to not squash you in certain cases. Um, so in the arg demo, oop, demo one, ah, oh, no. Oops, no, I've loaded, oh, that's something else I corrected. If you enter the wrong name, um, it doesn't complain. Okay, I can't remember that script name. I'm getting it. I'm getting it wrong. So I'll just load it from here. And so now, when I load this and I push it up to the edge, uh, this sector here has a non-squashable property because this is actually, it's very hard to see. But if you look at the physics close up, you'll uh, notice that it's actually sort of rubbing against the edges. And so I set a non-squashable property, and I made it so that you can you can halt the player's movement at any time by making it so they're not movable. Uh, I did this because there are certain instances where I want to um, modify uh, the modify the world based on the player's movement without the player actually moving. And so that's everything for this week. Um, next week I'm planning on doing masking, which I mentioned last week. So I go to mar I need to mask text and mask the world. And now have a little bit of an idea of how I'm going to mask the world. It shouldn't be too bad. Then the other thing is I need to do pruning of bodies. So if I draw the physics in this world, and I hide this menu, you can see that you've got a lot of bodies here. And I want to restrict what bodies are sh um, shown and what bodies are expanding based around their position, um, just to make things a little bit faster so we can have lots of bodies on screen at once. And just for all those bodies to only be updated in terms of what's being drawn, um, if you're not close enough to the player. And that's everything for this week. Thank you for watching. Hope you have a great week. Bye.